everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joining you today at Chawton Lockdown Literary Festival. It's a shame, of course, we can't all be meeting in person, but I'm looking forward to answering your questions later. We are living through extraordinary times, and the story I'm going to talk about, which is uh, the story told in my book, Endor Street, um, or No Man's Land, as it's called in America, has got many parallels for us today. When I've talked in the past about my books, people often ask me how I, how I first came across the story. So what was the inspiration for the books? And usually the answer is quite dull. There's no real eureka moment. But with Endor Street, there really was a dramatic moment of discovery. About 10 years ago, I was in the Wellcome Library for the History of Medicine, and I saw this painting on the wall. And I did a double take because it's rare enough today to see an operating theatre with only women in it. Um, currently, women make up about 48% of the medical profession in the UK, but they're still underrepresented in certain specialties, particularly surgery. And then I discovered that the picture actually shows an operating theatre in the First World War that was run and staffed entirely by women. So I was absolutely fascinated and amazed the hospital wasn't better known. So I began my journey to find out more about Endor Street and to bring that story to life. Well, Endor Street was unique. It was the only military hospital under the auspices of the British Army to be run and staffed entirely by women. Throughout the First World War, the women at Endor Street treated wounded men who came back from the battlefields. And the story of how the hospital came about is a remarkable example of courage, determination and stamina, which I think still speaks volumes to us today. When war broke out in August 1914, thousands of men signed up to fight and women signed up in their thousands too. They worked as volunteers in every capacity. Uh, they worked on the land, in the factories and on public transport like this conductorette um, on the buses in the Strand. And naturally enough, women doctors wanted to volunteer too. Within 10 days of war being declared, more than 60 women doctors had volunteered their services to the war office, but their help was not wanted. The Scottish surgeon, Elsie Ingalls, she offered her services to the war office in Scotland, and she was bluntly rejected with the famous words, my good lady, go home and sit still. Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson refused to sit still. They were both qualified doctors with more than 10 years experience each. Louisa, who was 41 at the time of the outbreak of the war, was a, a surgeon. Um, Flora, who was four years older, was a physician and anaesthetist. They both originally trained at the London School of Medicine for Women, although Flora finished her training at, the, uh, at Durham University. But despite the fact that their qualifications were exactly equivalent to their male colleagues, they were not um, allowed to work in uh, uh, normal hospitals. Um, as female doctors, they were only allowed to treat women and children. Women in the UK had won the right to qualify in medicine several decades earlier. In fact, Louisa's mother, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, had become the first woman to qualify in Britain as a doctor in 1865. But nearly 50 years later, at the outbreak of the First World War, women doctors were still confined to treating women and children. Most mainstream hospitals refused to appoint women doctors. It was taboo for women doctors to treat men and women rarely worked in surgery. So Flora and Louisa worked in women-run hospitals treating women and children. Louisa worked as a surgeon at the new hospital for women which had been founded by her mother, it later became famous as the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital, and together Flora and Louisa ran a small seven-bed hospital for poor families in, uh, for children in poor families in London. And you can see her in the photograph on the left in the very cramped outpatient department. Well, given the prejudice that they had faced, it's 
hardly surprising they had both joined the suffragettes. Louisa, in fact, served five weeks in Holloway Prison for smashing a window. Uh, in the photograph, she's actually on a, a march with her mother um, to um, a Downing Street to deliver a petition. And Flora was honorary physician to the suffragettes. She, so she treated many suffragettes for the ill effects of forced feeding. And they were also life partners. Flora and Louisa were devoted to each other and they lived together in the manner of a married couple. They'd marched together in the women's battle for the vote. But when war broke out, the suffragettes suspended their campaign for the vote in order to join the fight against a common enemy. Well, Flora and Louisa were just as keen as any male doctors to offer their services to the country, but they also saw war as an opportunity. It was a chance to prove that women doctors were equal to their male colleagues. They didn't waste time approaching the army, they knew they would be rejected, and instead they offered their help to the French Red Cross, who were more than happy to accept. Within a fortnight, they had raised £2,000, they'd grouped together a team of like-minded women and kitted themselves out with a military-style uniform. And then on 15th of September, just six weeks after war had begun, they set off with their team for France. They named their unit the Women's Hospital Corps. In addition to Murray and Anderson, there were three women doctors, later two more joined them, and eight nurses, and more nurses also came out later, and three women orderlies, plus four male helpers. When they arrived in Paris, they were allocated an empty luxury hotel, the Hotel Claridge in the Champs-Élysées. It was brand new, it had never actually opened, and within 48 hours they had scrubbed the floors, set up camp beds and converted the hotel into a 100 bed emergency hospital. So the stylish dining rooms were turned into wards, the ladies cloakroom was converted into an operating theatre, and the grill room, where, which had been designed for wealthy guests to linger over steaks and claret, was turned into the mortuary. And on their second night in Claridge's, the wounded began pouring in. And as women doctors, they were, of course, very inexperienced, and dangerously so even. They had no experience of military surgery, little experience of major surgery at all, and had never before treated men. But they learned quickly, and in any case, the wounds that they were treating the and the conditions that came to them were unprecedented. No doctors, male or female, had previously encountered the scale of casualties and the extent of wounds that the First World War unleashed. The men came to them with huge gaping wounds from shell injuries, multiple compound fractures, head injuries, and most of the wounds were in, um, heavily infected with gangrene, and there were also some early signs of shell shock. The British army officials who came to look around the hospital, quite hostile at first, were um, instantly converted. They were so impressed by what they saw that they became strong allies and advocates for the women. And when the women set up a second hospital near Boulogne, the army then gave that official status. Well, the Chateau Mauricien, which is uh, seen here in the postcard in rather more tranquil times, became the first hospital staffed by women to operate under the auspices of the army. And there they treated men from the First Battle of Ypres, who were um, arriving daily on ambulance trains in Boulogne. And then in early 1915, Murray and Anderson were invited to a meeting in London with Sir Alfred Keogh, the head of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Keogh had heard about their work in France from his colleagues, and now he made them an astonishing offer. He asked them to run a major military hospital in the heart of London. They accepted immediately, so they closed their units in France and they moved back to London. Endel Street Military Hospital opened in May 1915 in a former workhouse in Covent Garden. It had 520 beds, later increased to 573, in 17 wards, and it was and it would remain the only hospital within the British Army to be run and staffed by women. 
So apart from 22 male RAMC orderlies, and that was later reduced to eight, all of the 180 staff were women. There were 14 doctors, 29 trained nurses, and more than 80 orderlies. In fact, the orderlies did most of the daily work. They were nursing assistants, stretcher bearers, cooks, cleaners, clerks, and many of them were actually young, middle or upper class women who previously led lives uh, of leisure. So they um, had, no, had no idea really how to boil an egg, let alone empty a bedpan. Some of them were actually dropped off at the gates of Rendell Street um, in chauffeured cars every morning and collected the same way every day. But regardless of their background, all the women wore the same Endel Street uniform. They were awarded army pay and they were given honorary military rank. So Murray and Anderson became the equivalents of majors and Murray was later um, promoted to become Lieutenant Colonel. So she was the highest ranking woman in the British Army. Endel Street was on the front line of the capital's medical care. Ultimately, there would be 300 military hospitals receiving war wounded in London. But Endel Street was one of the 20 largest military hospitals in the capital. And within central London, it was one of the 10 biggest. And because of its proximity to major railway stations like Charing Cross, it was receiving the most serious cases. The convoys of wounded usually arrived in the middle of the night. And the imminent arrival of a convoy was announced by two strikes on a bell in the hospital courtyard. And then the orderlies who were on duty, who were living on site, hurriedly dressed and then lined up ready in the courtyard. As many as 80 men might be unloaded from the ambulances at one time. And despite the fact that the women had already proved themselves in France, Endel Street was seen as a huge gamble. Army chiefs predicted that it would not last six months. But it not only survived for six months, it was hailed as a triumph. At first, some of the wounded men who were being unloaded from the ambulances in the courtyard, as you can see here, were so shocked to be met and treated by women doctors, they thought they'd been sent there to die. They couldn't think of any other reason for arriving in a hospital run by women. But they very quickly accepted the women, and not only accepted them, but decided they were in the best hospital in London. And newspapers responded likewise. Initially, the press really treated Endel Street as something of a curiosity. But very soon, this changed and Endel Street became hailed as a, an emblem of the blighty, the blighty flight, fighting spirit. The Suffragettes Hospital, it was, as it was often known, became described as the most popular and the most successful in London. <clears throat> Endel Street was renowned for its efficient organisation and its professional care. The staff treated more than 26,000 wounded throughout the war. <clears throat> the vast majority of them were men, although there were about 2,000 women patients. And the surgeons performed more than 7,000 major operations, often operating eight to nine hours a day. They introduced pioneering treatments too. In 1916, um, Louisa Garrett Anderson and her pathologist, Helen Chambers, tested a new antiseptic ointment, uh, which was called BIP. It was bismuth, um, sorry, it was bismuth iodoform paraffin paste, so BIP for short. And they found that it not only healed wounds better than other methods, but because it could be left in place for as long as 10 days, it meant that dressings needed to be changed much less often, which was clearly pain, less painful for the men. So they first tried out BIP on men who'd been sent back uh, from the Somme and published their results in the Lancet a few months later. But Endel Street was also famous for its homely atmosphere because Anderson believed that the, more, the men were more wounded in their minds than in their bodies. So she insisted that the wards were always bright and cheerful. They had colorful bed quilts, um, standard lamps and fresh flowers. And the grim workhouse courtyard was turned into a tranquil haven where the men could relax and also enjoy festivities like the, the bank holiday fete um, that you can see in the postcard where families would be invited to join them. There was also a library with 5,000 books, which was run by two famous authors. 
and a theatre where they stage hundreds of entertainments, including concerts, magic acts, and pantomimes. They had more than 1,000 entertainers visiting every year. The men were also taught knitting and needlework to keep them occupied, and some of those still survive. But despite all these efforts at Jollity, it was exhausting and grueling work. Because on top of the long hours, the women were suffering uh, severe food shortages and they were coming under attack from air raids. Murray and Anderson were also strict disciplinarians and hard taskmasters. One orderly later said they were told they had to be not only as good as men, but better. But it was exhilarating work too, because the women were enjoying the first chance to do something they were good at, but that they were enjoying to work together for a common cause. So they were proving that they were as good as men. Well, after the war, Endell Street stayed open for another year, treating the victims of the Spanish flu. And that was really the darkest time. Throughout the war, the women had saved thousands of men from death and disability by working together. But they were no match for this invisible enemy, the flu virus. The pandemic caused between 50 million and 100 million deaths worldwide. And at the height of the second, the most lethal wave, which hit Britain in November 1918, nearly 30,000 people died in the UK in one week. At Endress Street, there were more men dying each week from the flu than had been dying in the war. And obviously it affected the staff too. 22 staff became ill with the flu and at least four died from it. But Endress Street was also one of the first military hospitals to test out new pioneering methods to prevent the virus spreading. So they began using face masks, which were not commonly um, used at the time. They segregated the wards and they screened the beds um, to protect patients from cross-infection. The doors finally closed in December 1919. So the war had changed everything for women. Women had gained um, in, um, independence, they'd gained financial independence, their clothes were different, they were wearing shorter hair, shorter skirts, smoking, but it had also changed nothing really. Women doctors and all the hospital's women staff were really expected to go back to exactly the lives they had led before. So medical schools, which had opened their doors in the war to women, now closed them again. Mainstream hospitals, which had remained open throughout the war because women doctors helped them, now refused to appoint women doctors again. And so most of the women doctors who'd worked at Hendra Street and gained all that incredible and surgical experience were now having to go back to treating women and children again, or work abroad, or retire. And it was going to be many more decades before women in medicine won equality. So Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson carried on working in medicine for a few more years, and then they retired to the countryside. Flora died not long afterwards in 1923. I think she'd been really worn out by her war work. And Louisa lived on alone for another 20 years. She worked in the Second World War in a casualty department before she died in 1943. And at that, at that point, an inscription was added onto Flora Murray's gravestone. And it reads, we have been gloriously happy. That always brings a bit, a bit of a tear to my eye. Well, my book is a tribute to all the women who worked at Endell Street and all the men who were treated there. I wrote it really to give voice to them, but also because I think it speaks to us today, especially today, about the extremes of human endurance, of loss and pain and sacrifice, but also courage, dedication and compassion, and the simple joy of being alive. So thank you for listening.